Hello. My name is Dr. Francois Ricard. I am an osteopath and a PhD. I am director of the International Madrid School of Osteopathy, EOM, and president of the Scientific European Federation of Osteopaths, SEFO. In this video, I want to talk to you about Friet's laws and coupled vertebral movements. Friet's laws on spinal physiology, like Kapanji's spinal physiology, are the subject of debate and discussion, too often misunderstood. I propose that we make some clarifications considering the most recent scientific work. The vertebral physiology according to Friet and the somatic vertebral dysfunctions described by Friet, which are two different things, should not be confused. Harrison Friet, 1878-1960, described in 1954 in his book, Principles of Osteopathic Technic, The Vertebral Mechanical Laws in Osteopathy. He studied the movement of the spine and individual vertebrae using fluoroscopy. The old Friet laws were revised, updated, and modified in 1981 by the Educational Council on Osteopathic Principles, ECOP, then by Fred Mitchell in 1986, and Richard Van Buskirk in 2000. Before approaching this topic, it is necessary to have a common vocabulary. The upright anatomical position is the neutral position, the easy flexion of American osteopaths. The forward lean movement is flexion. The final flexion range is hyperflexion. The backward tilt movement is extension. The final extension amplitude is hyperextension. The abbreviations used in Friet's laws are as follows. F stands for flex. E means extension. N stands for neutral position. S, that is, side bending is used to indicate the side bending of the vertebra. R is used to indicate rotation. In Friet's nomenclature, the first letter always indicates neutral position, flexion, or extension. The other letters S and R indicate a rotation in the convexity or in the concavity. When S is placed before R it indicates a rotation in convexity. When R is placed before S it indicates a rotation in the concavity. Thus, a vertebra in right FSR is in flexion, left side bending and right rotation in the right convexity. The Three Principles of Vertebral Movement Friet described two vertebral behaviors. A movement set of type 1, the first law, where contralateral movements of side bending and rotation occur, that is, of opposite sides. A movement called type 2, the second law, where ipsilateral movements of lateral bending and rotation occur, on the same side. First Friet Law NSR FSR ESR. When the spine is in a neutral position, in slight flexion or extension, the side bending to one side will be accompanied by a rotation to the opposite side. A rotation occurs in the convexity. It is the type of behavior seen in scoliosis. Second Friet Law ERS and FRS. When the spine is in hyperflexion, or hyperextension, non-neutral position, side bending to one side will be accompanied by a rotation to the same side. A rotation occurs in the concavity. Third Law Nelson, 1948, revised 1963 There is a third principle enunciated by Friette in 1963. It is based on Nelson's 1948 writings. 
in the spine when motion is introduced in one of the three planes. This will reduce the range of motion in the other two planes. Conclusion It should be noted that what Friette has described are two possible models of coupled motions. Friette's description is not false. It is incomplete, considering current studies. Coupled Vertebral Movements Punjabi et al. 1994 There are many different models of movements coupled to the spine. These couplings raise considerable controversy in the literature. Not only are their characteristics open to debate, but their very existence is sometimes questioned. These discrepancies are due to the complexity of the movement analyzed. Lumbar Coupled Movements Let us first examine the coupled movements at the lumbar level. According to Piercy et al., 1984, in the upper lumbar spine, axial rotation is accompanied by a contralateral side bending. In L5-S1, axial rotation and side bending generally occur in the same direction. L4-L5 is a transition level with variable coupling. The lordotic curve of the lumbar spine and muscle control are probably the main factors determining the relationship between primary and coupled rotations. For Fuji et al. 2007, the coupled side bending of the L1-L2 and L4-L5 segments occurs in the opposite direction to the trunk rotation, while the side bending of T12-L1 and L5-S1 occurs in the same direction. According to Shin et al. 2013, the upper segments of L2-L3 and L3-L4 showed a contralateral side bending coupled towards the direction opposite to axial rotation, while the lower segments L4-L5 and L5-S1 showed an ipsilateral side bending movement, coupled towards the same direction as the rotation. This study demonstrated that the lumbar coupling of rotation and side bending depends on the vertebral segment and aims to maintain the overall dynamic balance of the body. Another study by Percy et al., 1985, indicates that in flexion and extension, the coupled axial rotation is 2 degrees and the side flexion is 3 degrees. In the upper three levels, contralateral bending and rotation occurs, but ipsilateral in L5-S1, during side bending there is also generally an extension at the upper levels and a flexion at L5-S1. According to Punjabi et al., 1989. The coupling patterns change significantly with the intervertebral level. In the neutral position, rotation is associated with a contralateral coupled side bending, which varies from 2 degrees of side bending in L1-2, 0 degrees in L3-4, and 2.5 degrees in L5-S1. Side bending produces approximately 1.7 degrees of contralateral coupled axial rotation at all levels except L1-L2, where it was 0 degrees. At the L2-3 level, axial rotation from one side produces a contralateral coupled side bending of 0.5 degrees in full extension, and 2.5 degrees in full flexion. At the L2-L3 level, the lateral flexion produces a contralateral axial rotation of 2.5 degrees, which does not vary with posture, while the coupled rotation varied from 1.7 degrees of flexion to full extension, and 0.8 degrees of extension at full flexion. According to Kulwicki et al., 1996, the type of intervertebral coupling is partially determined by lumbar lordosis. One of the most interesting studies was that of Vincenzino and Toomey. 1993. 20 lumbar spines from cadavers were placed in different positions of the lumbar spine. Extension and left side bending. Extension and right side bending. Flexion and left side bending. And flexion and right side bending. The coupled rotation was measured. 
the results indicated that the direction of the coupled rotation of the entire lumbar spine, E between L1 and S1, was significantly different between flexion and extension of the lumbar spine. There was no relationship between coupled rotation and the geometry of the zygopophyseal joint, or intervertebral disc degeneration. The coupled rotation was found to be influenced by the position of the lumbar spine, and the level of the vertebral segment, but not by the geometry of the facet joints, or the amount of degeneration in intervertebral disc. It was found that the coupled movement of the lumbar spine, was influenced by the position of the lumbar spine, and differed significantly according to the vertebral levels. The intervertebral motion segments L1, L2 and L3, L4, were shown to be in the opposite direction to the direction of side flexion, when the lumbar spine was extended, and the direction of coupled rotation was in the same direction, as the direction of side flexion when the lumbar spine was flexed. Segments L2, L3 and L4, L5, underwent a coupled rotation that was opposite in the direction of segments L1, L2 and L3, L4. That is, the direction of coupled rotation was opposite to the direction of side flexion, when the lumbar spine was flexed, and the direction of coupled rotation was in the same direction as the direction of side flexion, when the lumbar spine was in extension. The L5-S1 segment was unique, since the direction of the coupled rotation was always in the same direction, as the direction of side bending, independent of the flexion extension position of the lumbar spine. Coupling at the lumbar level is highly variable. According to the vertebral level, according to the position of the lumbar curve, it varies with flexion and with increased lordosis. It is worth noting in this summary table that the coupling is reversed between flexion and extension. The coupling that was ipsilateral becomes contralateral and vice versa. Let us now examine the coupled movements at the thoracic level. According to Edmonston et al., 2007, the amplitudes and patterns of coupled movement of the thorax seem to be influenced by the posture from which the movement begins. The amplitudes of side bending coupled with thoracic rotation are small. The amplitudes and patterns of coupled chest movement depend on posture. Ipsilateral pattern is more common in flexion. Contralateral pattern is more common in extension and in neutral position. Coupling thoracic movement patterns vary between individuals. At the thoracic level, several studies indicate a coupled movement pattern that varies between subjects. According to Willems et al., 1996, from T2 to T10 an ipsilateral coupling pattern of side bending and rotation predominates. For Gerchek et al., 2008, T11-T12 presents a great inner subject variation. Fujimori et al., 2014, observed high variability in segments T2-T3 to T5-T6. Finally, we will talk about the coupled movements at the cervical level. The study by Cook et al., 2006, found a 100% concordance in the direction of coupling to the same side, in the lower cervical vertebral segments, and a variation in the coupling patterns of the upper cervical segments C0-C1 and C1-C2. In the study by Ishii et al., 2004, Side bending coupled with axial rotation was observed in the opposite direction to axial rotation at C0-C1 and C1-C2. An extension coupled with axial rotation occurred in both C0-C1 mean 13.3 degrees and C1-C2 mean 6.9 degrees. According to Ia et al. 1993 the coupling movements observed at the cervical level include an extension of 10 degrees in C0-C1, with 11 degrees of side bending in C1-C2. Almost all cervical axial rotation, 80%, occurs in C1-C2, 
while only 4 degrees of rotation occur in C0 C1. Furthermore, as the axial rotation C1 C2 increased, so did the rotation in the opposite direction at C0 C1, while less rotation was observed below C2. According to Harrison et al. 2000, the main coupled movement was the side bending, that changed direction in the C4 C5 space, creating an S shape. Upper cervical side bending, in C3 C4, was contralateral. The lower cervical and upper thoracic side bending were ipsilateral. Opposite flexion and extension movements, in healthy subjects, were reported by Anders et al., Reinhardt's et al., and Crane et al. Anti-directional joint movement, is defined as a movement opposite to the original direction, to the main movement. These movements are not systematic during flexion and extension. According to Van Mamera et al., 1990, brief anti-directional movements of C7-T1 during flexion, are accompanied by anti-directional upper cervical movements in extension, C0-C1. Most of the cervical spine, exhibits coupled ipsilateral lateral bending, and rotation movements. From C2 to C7, ipsilateral coupled side bending and rotation occur. C0-C1 performs a coupled movement of contralateral side bending and rotation. Limitations of the studies carried out Several studies were conducted on cadavers. Several studies were carried out in sections of the column, isolated from the context. There are limitations of the 2D or 3D study techniques. In the in vivo studies, the selected subjects were classified as healthy, but we know that the area of hypomobility, primary osteopathic dysfunction, is asymptomatic. No study explains the mechanism of the coupled movements found. In conclusion, the coupled movements in the spine are highly variable, depending on the vertebral level in the individual. This means that vertebral behavior is difficult to predict. Better studies are needed to confirm what the coupled movements are, and to clarify what their mechanisms are. Friet's description was a breakthrough in the 1950s. It is not false. It is only incomplete. Because it did not have the current tools. Here, we have the references of the scientific articles used in this conference. Thank you for listening.